Main character. They are the conduits through which our favorite fictional stories of all time are told through. And while some main characters play a massive role in the universe and how all the historical events in the universe pan out, like Naruto, other main characters work more as a way to introduce us to other characters who will carry the story for the large majority of that story's run, like Yuji. And this is the beauty of main characters. There's as many main characters as there is fictional universes. And while a lot of shonen main characters feel as though they're being copy and pasted from some grander scheme on how to make the perfect shonen MC, there are some shonen MC who truly break that mold. However, since interacting with a fictional universe is pretty much the most individual thing that one can do, a lot of people have differing opinions on different MCs. A main character that you could think is nuanced and underappreciated, incredibly complicated and cool, other people could deem as one note. A character who doesn't break the mold, but is a perfect example of the mold. And there's nothing wrong with that. Technically, as people are individuals, so are the experiences they're going to have with certain pieces of fictional media. But the reason that I'm saying all this is because my favorite main character in all of fictional media is somebody that a lot of people refer to as one note, as boring, as a symbol of the mold. And personally, I just don't see it. See, my favorite main character of all time across all media is Gone from Hunter x Hunter, but I stand relatively alone on this hill. See, a lot of people refer to Gone as a boring MC, citing the fact that he's a child who's protected by the people around him and never really displays much in the way of character development. And anytime Gone goes through something truly consequential that should have made him develop as a character, he kind of shrugs it off. However, for as long as I've known Gone, that is to say, since I first consumed Hunter Hunter in either anime or manga form, I've never seen that. But since Hunter Hunter was one of the first anime I ever saw, it sent me into a spiral in the early days of my weebdom. It got me thinking, do I enjoy boring one note MCs? Am I a fan of the mold that they use to cast these shonen MCs over and over and over again? These soft soul archetypes that are a ray of sunshine in their universe and only ever truly get angry when you hurt their friends. These symbols of perpetual innocence and the massive amount of power that they have to hold on to said perpetual innocence. And what I realized is I do like that kind of character. I like Goku more than I like Vegeta. I like Naruto more than I like Sasuke. I like Ichigo more than I like Oryu or Renji or Rukia. I like Luffy more than I like Zoro. I am incredibly drawn to these archetypal main characters because I myself am forever the optimist. My job is to yell about anime. I've held on to my innocence. I live a childlike existence. And thus I find these characters, these rays of sunshine, these perpetual monuments to childlike innocence incredibly relatable. But that doesn't mean that Gone falls into that categorization. See, what I realized is that while I do love the mold, it's why I gravitate towards those sunshine characters, Gone doesn't exist within that mold. Though at a surface level, it might appear as though he does. In actuality, once you begin to peel back the onion that is Gone, you'll realize he's far from that mold. Gone while being that archetypal MC, that ray of sunshine that only truly shows their darkness when you hurt their friends, is also much more than that. See, for those of you who have consumed Hunter Hunter as background noise, Gone might seem one note. Child blundering his way through a complicated world, and every single time he runs into a problem, he's able to get just strong enough to get over that problem. And in that capacity, he's very similar to all of the other previous shonen protagonists that I've listed. A character who's always as strong as he'll need to be. But as you get deeper into Hunter Hunter and deeper into Gone as a character, you begin to realize that he's actually nothing like that. But what is he like? What is the true archetyping of Gone? And how does he break the mold of your typical shonen protagonist? Well, we're gonna be answering all those questions and a whole lot more today, guys. But first, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And if you like the idea of me doing deep dives into some of your favorite anime characters, guys, you're gonna love my anime podcast, Taku's Anonymous, where me and Daddy Mata break down everything that happened in anime this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. See, as somebody who's personally watched Hunter x Hunter, I believe five to seven times, I have a very close connection to the story. And thus, to sit here on my high horse and be like, oh, how did you guys miss some of these subtle undertones, would be pretentious. It's my favorite anime, it's my favorite manga, it has 
my favorite characters, I consume it over and over and over again. And thus, I'd like to think that I'm able to make connections in the Hunter Hunter universe thematically that your average person on one watch through may or may not have made. So I don't want this video to come across as, oh, you simpletons couldn't even figure out Gon's character. I just have a close personal connection to him as a character and the universe. Now that I have that incredibly important caveat out of the way, Let's get into the video. See, everything I've pretty much said in this video up to this point has just been lumping going in with all the other archetypal shonen MCs, kind of flying directly in the face of the point that I'm trying to make. However, the biggest differential between Gon and all of the other previous shonen MCs that I've listed is the protection of innocence. See, characters like Naruto or Goku or Luffy represent the protection of childlike innocence. They're people who are thrust into incredibly scary and mentally scarring situations. However, their sheer power and the sheer power of the determination allows them to protect their childlike innocence. Naruto fights an entire war where 20,000 people die. He lives through the death of his father and his mother. He's shunned as an orphan. His only friend is a swing and yet, he never loses his smile. To use a well-known but unfortunately religious analogy here, Naruto is supposed to be the Jesus archetype. A man born into a world filled with evil, and even when that world would try to shove their evil onto this golden boy, that golden boy would arise and become a man, a shepherd, to lead these people out of their evil ways. And the way that these MCs achieve that is through overwhelming power. So even though the world, the universe, is filled with these massive, powerful bad guys trying to impose their evil wills on the golden boys and the world around them, these main characters are always able to get just strong enough to defeat that evil. And thus, since they're in this perpetual cycle of victory, though close victories, they never truly have the innocence that they carry destroyed. And therefore, in incredibly derivative terms, they use their power to protect their innocence. Which makes sense, shonen anime is specifically targeted towards young boys. Young boys who live with the ideology that they can take on the world and that they can bend the world to their will through power and friendship. An entire subgrouping in the population that hasn't truly realized what the earth can be like. And thus these main characters walk out in front of us as these Jesus-like archetype characters who are meant to represent what humanity could truly be if we had enough power to protect our innocence. But Gon doesn't represent that. Maybe on a surface level, it appears as though he represents that. As Gon, just like all of the other MCs that I've listed, gets strong enough every single arc to defeat the big bad that he's up against. At least, that's what it appears like. But while these other MCs might represent protecting their innocence through the means of power, Gon actually represents the loss of innocence. In essence, he is the antonym of this typical shonen MC. Gon starts his story with the same level of childlike innocence as any other MC in history. However, unlike every other MC in history, Gon can't protect this childlike innocence. And arc after arc, that innocence is stripped away from him. And if that childlike innocence isn't stripped away from him in an arc, it's because somebody who has a better grasp of what humanity in the earth can be like is protecting that innocence for him. In this way, while Gon is the main character of Hunter x Hunter, the timeline is a time bomb until eventually either Gon isn't strong enough to rise to the challenge or there isn't somebody strong enough to be there to protect Gon and his innocence. The story is a game of Jenga, except instead of a tower of blocks, you're pulling blocks out of a dam until eventually the dam bursts. See, Gon realizes arc after arc that he doesn't have the power to protect those around him. And he especially doesn't have the power to protect himself. He realizes slowly but surely that the world is outside of his control. And that is very astutely symbolized by the fact that Gon starts his story on a small island, catching the biggest fish on the island. Gon, rather clearly in this moment, is displaying the fact that he, on this small fishing island, has become the biggest fish in a very small pond. And thus, as Gon has become the biggest fish in this very small pond, he wants to see the world's other ponds, the bigger ponds, and maybe see if he's still the biggest fish in those. And thus, Gon goes off to the hunter exams, where Gon very quickly realizes 
that he's not even close to the biggest fish. In the Hunter exam, Gon goes toe to toe with the likes of Hisoka and Netero, people whose power he may never reach. He battles against Hanzo, somebody who we as an audience and Gon as a character didn't even know was that powerful. And yet the level of class difference between Hanzo, a relatively non-character so far as we knew, and Gon, our main character, is so glaring there's nothing Gon can do. Gon can't even so much as get up without being knocked out again by Hanzo. However, Gon persists as Hanzo isn't allowed to kill him until eventually Hanzo taps out of the battle and Gon moves forward. But I know what you're saying. Nick seems like Gon was able to win through childlike perseverance. But what we have to realize here is that Gon does not care about protecting himself. That has never been the core tenet of what Gon is about. In fact, Gon, more often than not, will almost die in order to save those around him. And therefore, Gon succeeding in a battle against Hanzo by letting himself get knocked out a bunch is not a victory for Gon, so far as his moral standing would say. Because what Gon is actually most interested in is protecting his friends, of which he has three in the Hunter exams, Kilawa, Karapika, and Leorio. However, after Gon's battle against Hanzo, he's knocked unconscious, and thus Gon isn't in a situation where he can either help or watch his friends battle in their Hunter exam battles, and thus Kilawa technically loses his battle when he kills the person he was battling against, and there was nothing that Gon, possibly the one person who could have broken Kilawa out of his hypnotic state, could do because of Gon's weakness and inability to battle against somebody like Hanzo in a traditional manner. And thus Gon, for all intents and purposes, at least to Gon, has failed in this hunter exam arc. Passing was obviously important to him, he needs his hunter license to one day find Jing, but his friends passing, and more importantly, his friends being with him is just as important, if not more important, than him passing. And that's a stark reality for Gon, who's now essentially realized that his current power level cannot protect the people around him. And thus the first thing that Gon does upon awakening from his coma is going to find Kilawa. But once again, as Gon arrives at the Zoldic compound, he's too weak to even get in. In fact, Gon, Leorio, and Karapika all together are too weak to get in. However, after some training with the guard, they're able to enter into the Zoldic compound, where, objectively, they all probably should have died. See, as Leorio, Karapika, and Gon make their way deeper and deeper into the Zoldic compound, they have to start dealing with some real obstacles, like Canary, the butler, who won't let Gon pass a certain line. And over and over and over again, Gon puts his body on the line to try and cross this line. Because once again, Gon isn't strong enough to get past Canary in a conventional sense. However, once his determination causes Canary to waver even a little bit, Kikyo, Kilawa's mother, shoots her in the head with a Nen bullet. Now, Kikyo and Kalato in that moment could have killed all three of them very easily. However, in this moment, all of them were being protected by Silva Zoldic. See, Silva, the patriarch of the family, told Kikio to not kill them, because Silva wanted Kilawa to go out with them, adventure the world, and then come back to the Zoldics when he was prepared, as Silva understands that Kilawa one day will be stronger than either him or Zeno, but simply for the small crime of intruding upon the Zoldic compound, Gon very easily could have been killed and forgotten about. So in this moment, Gon is not only being protected by Silva, but also kind of Kilawa, which will be a trend, mind you. After Kilawa is retrieved from the Zoldic compound, him and Gon go to York New City to participate in the Heavens Arena. And for a while, about 190 levels, it appears as though Kilawa and Gon are in fact the big fish. However, as Kilawa and Gon make it to the 200th floor, they realize they're lacking something. And that something is Nen. And that monsters like Sasora and Guido and Hisoka exist on the 200th floor. And they can use an ability that neither Gon or Kilawa know how to use. But here's the thing. Even technically, after Gon and Kilawa learn how to use Nen, Gon isn't prepared for his fights. Gon battles against Guido. And for those of you who don't remember all the names in Hunter Hunter, that's the guy with all the tops who also is himself a top. Not like in the you get it. However, Gon, while using Nen, still loses to this other Nen user. He has his forearm shattered. And thus, Gon, even though he's able to recover from injuries very fast, isn't in a situation advantageous enough where he can battle again on floor 200 without being demoted. But Kilawa isn't in a similar situation. Kilawa not only wins his fight against the Electric Whip user, but also sneaks into Sadaso's room with a knife and says, if you try to fight me or Gon, I will come back here and 
kill you. And what Heaven's Arena is supposed to depict to us as viewers is the fact that Kilua is necessary in maintaining Gon's sense of innocence. It's supposed to depict to us that Gon's lackadaisical nature won't actually help in the real world when things get tough. And Kilua is acting as the blueprint of the level of brutality that one needs to make it through the darkest sections of the Hunter Hunter universe. And therefore, because Kilua was raised as the monster with a level of brutality you would never see in a child, his level of brutality is able to protect the level of innocence in love that exists in Gon. But this isn't the only time that Gon is protected. Gon on floor 200 also gets his battle against Hisuka, where he's able to land one decisive blow against Hisuka. However, if you've read the manga beyond where the anime ends, you'll know that one punch is definitely not enough to put Hisuka down. However, the referee of the fight, understanding that Hisuka is way more powerful than Gon, quickly gets the fight over with by giving Hisuka 10 points, protecting Gon from grievous bodily harm. And once again, we have somebody who understands the brutality of the world and understands the danger that Hisuka represents to this child who's nowhere near him in terms of power level and gets Gon out of that fight as fast and safely as possible. And thus the irony of Gon's character is while he's singularly motivated in protecting those around him, he's usually the person being protected. Because fortunately, even though he's blundering his way through an incredibly dark and dangerous world, there's people around him that are strong enough to make sure that that dark and dangerous world never breaks that dam. But after Heaven's Arena, it only gets worse for Go, and we begin to see those first cracks in that dam. See, after the Heaven's Arena arc, we have the York New City auction arc, where Go and Kilo are trying to use the money that they got from Heaven's Arena to buy a copy of Greed Island. However, while this arc is supposed to be a light and jovial arc about two kids trying to get enough money together to buy a video game, it's anything but that. See, the York New City auction draws the Phantom Troop, the world's most famous and deadliest assassins and thieves, and they want everything. Everything from the York New City auction they want to take. But as a massive bounty is put out on members of the Phantom Troop and Gon and Kilua need the money to buy a copy of Greed Island, they begin tracking the members of the Phantom Troop. And as they now believe that they've mastered Nen and Zetsu, they believe that they should be able to deal with people like the Phantom Troop. But once again, Gon goes through a study of hubris. Gon has always been able to track things without them knowing that he was there. He was even able to hide from Hisuka during the Hunter exam. And thus, for all intents and purposes, he had no reason to believe that the Phantom Troop would know that he was tracking them but they did and they caught gone and kilua twice and it was as gone and kilua came face to face with members of the phantom troop like nobunaga that they realized they weren't even in a pond they weren't even in a lake they were in the ocean. Weaker members of the Phantom Troop like Pakanoda were still massively stronger than Gon and Kilowa combined, let alone combat focused members of the Phantom Troop like Nobunaga. And thus when Gon gets brought back to the Phantom Troop's hideout and Nobunaga insists that they arm wrestle, defeating him time and time again, almost breaking Gon's hand, Gon gets angry. This is truly the first time that something hasn't been between Gon and unbridled evil. And it's while Gon is arm wrestling with Nobunaga that we see the first crack on the dam. See, Gon becomes infuriated, and not because Nobunaga is hurting his hand or beating him in arm wrestling. Gon becomes infuriated because of how many people the Phantom Troop have killed. He wonders how they can go about their day-to-day -day lives knowing that they've murdered dozens, if not hundreds, of people. And Gon lets his anger out, and it manifests as Ren that Gon channels into his arm to overpower the likes of Nobunaga. And in that moment, Gon's possible hysterical, anger-driven power is hinted at. But before Gon can manifest enough strength to battle against any members of the Phantom Troop, Phaeton grabs him by the back of the neck and cranks his arm behind his back. See, some will push back against this point and say that Gon has been dealing with unbridled evil for a long time. I mean, he's been around Hisuka since almost episode one. But Hisuka is an enigma, and also Gon doesn't know he's a member of the Phantom Troop. Gon simply knows that Hisuka's Nen freaks him out, and that Hisuka as a person freaks him out, as well as understanding that Hisuka is strong. But that's about it. Gon understands the Phantom Troop is evil. Gon understands that the Phantom Troop hurt other people, and that's what makes Gon upset. Not that he's been hurt, but that they've hurt other people. But Gon wouldn't be done with the Phantom Troop, as the next arc after York New City Auction is Greed Island. And one of the first things that Gon and Kilo will have to go through after entering into Greed Island is realize that all the people who tried to recruit them into a group so they could work together to gather all of the cards have been marked 
with bombs. However, since Gon and Kilawa decided they wanted to complete the video game on their own, they've been spared from the bomber. But once again, let's remind ourselves that Gon has never once been interested in saving himself. And thus, all of these relatively nice people who wanted to work with Gon and Kilawa in a cooperative fashion have now been killed. And once again, there was nothing Gon or Kilowa could do. In this circumstance, Gon is completely and utterly confronted by the greed and brutality of human nature. As the bomber wants to clear Greed Island and gather all of the cards of the people he's killed for the possible monetary benefits at the end. And thus the entirety of the Greed Island arc is wrapped around stopping that bomber. Less for revenge for the people he's already killed and more to stop him before he kills anybody else. And thus Gon and Kilowa link up with Bisky and they master Nen. And this leads us to a final blowout battle at the end of Greed Island, where Gon once again puts his life on the line to defeat the bomber, going so far as to let the bomber blow off one of his hands. But Gon couldn't have accomplished this by himself. Both Bisky and Kilua had to take on members of the bomber's crew, as well as set an elaborate trap for Genthru, the bomber, to fall into so Gon could be victorious. However, once again in this battle against Genthru, we see Gon begin to tap into this monsterized idea of how to acquire strength. As he sits there with one hand left using Jaja -Ja Ken on a borderline defenseless man to knock him unconscious to steal his cards, you begin to realize that Gon's innocence is slowly slipping away from him. The demeanor changes. He has a scowl on his face. He despises Genthru for everything that he is, and he's willing to kill this man as he douses a bomb user with gasoline in order to be victorious. However, the true reality of Gon's character shift doesn't happen, until the Chimera Ant Arc. The Chimera Ant Arc for many is considered too long or boring or the worst arc in Hunter x Hunter, which I think is inaccurate on all three counts. I actually think the Chimera Ant Arc is Hunter x Hunter's best arc. I think it's the best written. I think it has the best pacing. I think it has the best job at fleshing out the universe. I think it has the best characters. But more than anything, it is also the best at developing Gon as a main character. And in a very non-traditional way, mind you. See, the problem with the Chimera Ant Arc is that it's the first arc where there is no one strong enough to protect Gon. Sure, in the early days of the Chimera Ant Arc, Kite seems to be this incredibly powerful hunter. He has a Nen weapon, able to manifest different kinds of Nen weapons depending on a lottery pool. His design is cool. He was once with Jing. Everything about him seemed like an immovable mountain of a man who was gonna clear out this entire arc for Gon, like people had done for Gon in all the arcs prior. But that is not the case. And in actuality, the Chimera Ant Arc would be the first arc where Gon truly has to face the reality that he's been protected from for the entire show. See, while Kite seems like, and really is, an incredibly powerful hunter, the Chimera Ants, and specifically the Royal Guard, are different beasts entirely. Characters so strong that pretty much nothing in the universe can take them out. And thus, even though Kite is designated as the protector of this arc, he dies in quickly. See, even Kite, a man who saved Gon's life as a child, a man who trained with Jing, a possible three-star hunter, one of the strongest hunters on Earth, is killed like he's nothing. And while Gon had dealt with loss on his periphery in places like Greed Island, where people he knew were killed by the bomber, in this circumstance, the one thing that Gon's entire personality is built around, his core tenet, is broken. Gon, the child willing to lose his own life to protect those around him, causes Kite to lose his life protecting Gon. And thus, in this moment, Gon begins to realize every single situation throughout the duration of this entire story where he's been protected. And while in every other situation, things had turned out squeaky clean, in this situation, the person who was strong enough to battle against the malevolent forces of the other side was yanked away from Gon. And thus, it's in this moment that the dam that's protecting Gon's innocence is destroyed. And therefore, so is Gon. See, Gon up until this moment was innocence, personified. He fell into your archetypal mold of an MC. But what happens when you take that innocence away? What happens when you make the main character realize that not only can they not hold on to that innocence, but they're not strong enough to protect that innocence. Well, some characters will get more powerful so they can get to the new threshold that they need to be at in order to protect that innocence. And that's not what Gon does. And that's why he breaks the mold of your archetypal shonen MC. See, Gon, instead of trying to get stronger, kind of loses himself. I mean, yes, he does train with Knuckle and Shoot to get stronger so he can enter into the Chimera Ant's territory and be somewhat useful. And while Gon's primary focus hasn't really changed all that much, as Gon doesn't know whether or not Kite is dead, Gon's primary focus would change 
very soon. See, obviously Gon trains with Knuckle and Shoot in order to be strong enough to get Kite back, which could very much be classified as protecting his friends. However, the childlike idealism that Kite is still alive is actually supposed to work as the perfect backdropping to Gon's character development. But as Gon works his way into Chimera and territory, he realizes that Kite can't come back. But even after Gon figures out Kite is dead, he believes that Pito should be able to bring Kite back to life. And this childlike idealism and inability to actually grasp the actual situation is supposed to enunciate this loss of innocence that Gon is going through. To show that once that innocence, the entirety of Gon's personality is destroyed, what's replaced is a monster, a product of the evil that Gon's dam has been keeping out this entire time. But now that there's a vacuum where that innocence once was, the evil of the outside world is coming in and filling that vessel. And once that last bit of childlike whimsy and innocence is stripped away from Gon, he's no longer Gon. He's the adult version of himself, a monster created by making a pact to give up the entirety of his life in order to get revenge. Because once again, Gon's life has never mattered to Gon. However, Gon's life has never mattered to Gon in matters of saving his friends. But in this moment of Gon monsterizing, he's not saving his friends. He's getting revenge. He's equalizing with a world that he's just now interacting with for the first time. And as he smashes Pito's head over and over and over again, making it essentially a paste, Gon is in anguish over the loss of innocence that he's gone through. Punching away at the personification of the evil that's been trying to chip away at Gon for his entire existence. As Gon's body in its adult form is symbolic of the fact that Gon wasn't ready for the world. The level of power that Gon would need in order to beat back the evil of the world and hold on to his ideals he wouldn't be able to get until he was full grown and the price that he paid for believing that he was a fish big enough to swim in the ocean was his life. Now, obviously, Gon doesn't die. He's saved by Aluka, but figuratively, Gon does die and is reborn as a much smaller fish. See, when Gon is brought back after the Chimera Antark, he's brought back with no Nen. See, the contract that he made with himself is that he would take all of the Nen he would ever have in his lifetime to destroy Pito. And now that he's been reborn, his power has been adjusted to how powerful Gon now realizes he is in the greater scope of the universe, which is nothing. See, Gon is a character study in hubris. He's the Icarus of the anime world. He shows us how the lackadaisical approaches of anime characters to real life issues wouldn't work in an actual circumstance, and that without divine intervention or somebody else more powerful and more versed in how the universe works there to protect you, you'll lose. Or at the very least, if you win, It'll cost you your life. Gon is cumbersome to those around him, dangerous when there's no one left to protect him. He is a personification of the rage that a child feels when they realize the innocence they were raised with doesn't work in the real world. He is a walking study of the feeling that every child turning into an adult has felt. When you realize that the superpowers that you thought you had as a child weren't real, and they can't help you. Gon is a child raised to believe that he is the strongest amongst humanity. However, when he's thrown into the anime equivalent of high school or college or the corporate world, he realizes that change can't happen alone. He realizes that the world eats the innocent and destroys the people who believe they can change it on their own. Gon separates himself from every other MC because not everything works out for him. He gets tripped up, gets powerful, gets in some fights, loses everything everything and heads home weaker than he started. He's a representation to all of us that while sometimes we believe that we're bigger and badder than everything the world could ever throw at us, without help and humility, one day we might realize that we're just a big fish in a small pond. And thus I say to the people who believe that Gon is one note that he's not one note. You just can't read the sheet music. But what do you guys think? Do you think Gon is an interesting MC who depicts the loss of innocence, or do you believe he's one note and boring? Tell me in the comments below. And why you guys are down there, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. So blue, I'm flaking so much, and I'm in pain.